Okay, folks, uh, welcome uh, to today's July 18th uh, edition of the Research Innovation Transition Forum. Uh, and uh, as a reminder for everyone, um, we, uh, well, actually this is new practice. We are recording these sessions now uh, to upload to the web page. So if you, um, uh, just to keep that in mind, uh, today, uh, also a reminder to everyone that the, uh, so the purpose of the, uh, these uh, forums are to provide uh, weather service uh, field headquarters, regional headquarters, um, information about uh, potential projects uh, that may be transitioned uh, to weather service operations or possibly transferred. So we, we present things of uh, different uh, readiness for transition. Uh, some things are in their, um, their incubation stage. Some are already in the pipeline. Um, and we also invite our, our NOAA partners to these calls. Uh, so, uh, and the, the presentations are available as soon as we can get them on the RIT forum webpage for people to, to peruse them both before the talks and after. And as I said, today's uh, presentation we are recording, and so when it's, uh, the recording is available, we will let everyone know through the email list. Uh, to, uh, today's, uh, before I go uh, uh, and introduce the speaker, um, let's just go around and uh, get a, um, a roll call. So this is Steve Smith, in, well, first in Silver Spring, Steve Smith with the RIT. Mike Sherma with MDL. CSU, MDL. Major at Chris Angelo, Steve. I'm of uh, India. Richard May, uh, Office of uh, <coughs> Climate, Water, and Weather Services, Marine. Uh, John Crockett, MDL. Sienna Gonzalez, MDL. Brad Coleman, MDL. Bob Vaughn, MDL. This is Wayne Weeks, the Marine Branch of Oakwood. And also John Chattel of uh, the RIT. Uh, now, quickly, on the on the who's on the line, please. Joan Bonan, Aqua. Southern Region Headquarters. Eastern Region Headquarters. Western Region. Walt yep. McCall and DBC. WFO Gaylord, Michigan. Uh, Roger Pierce at the National Weather Service Office in San Diego. Tom Filiaggi, MDL. Jeff Medlin, <laughs> Weather Service Mobile. Robin Radline, Alaska Region. Uh, Julia Rutherford, Charleston, West Virginia. Scott Kennedy, Newport. Ken Sparrow. I'm Anyone else? Okay. If not, uh, please hold your peace. Um, so also, uh, please mute your phone uh, if you don't have a question. So the format here is we'll have our speaker present for about 30 minutes, and we'll have 30 minutes of question and answer. Uh, so please hold your questions till the question and answer period, unless it's something of uh, uh, important clarification for the speaker. So today's topic is Rip Current Local Collaboration Project Observation Analysis and Forecasting. I'll be presented by Mike Cherma, John Chattel, and C.S. Wu of MDL. Mike Cherma is going to be uh, driving the presentation. And just for disclosure, uh, all these three folks are in my branch in MDL. So with that, uh, Mike, take it away. Okay, thank you, Steve. Um, uh, the RIP Current Local Collaboration Project, uh, Observation Analysis and Forecasting, uh, is uh, basically a, a project that's uh, with the, the end goal of improving uh, situational awareness and forecasts of rip currents on a, a, a WFO by WFO basis. Uh, rip currents, uh, um, just for you know, basic uh, information, a jet-like seaward flow across the surf zone of a beach. Uh, in the slide two here, you can see sort of the mushroom shapes of, a, of rip currents uh, in the photographs there as, as they move out. Now, uh, we won't discuss uh, the structure of rip currents all that much, um, but uh, the Comet program, which uh, uh, has uh, created this image, has a great uh, series of rip current uh, uh, informational uh, courses, that uh, rip current forecasting, rip, rip current fundamentals. So if you want to learn uh, a lot about uh, how rip currents are formed and how to forecast them, uh, I recommend going to the Comet program uh, 
through the learning center. But uh, in general, um, what, what happens uh, at, at uh, really daily on beaches is that as the waves come in and they break, you have uh, a water mass transport that, where the water tumbles in towards the shore, and basically it's got to go somewhere. Now, it, it doesn't always go straight back out again because there's more incoming waves. And so, so there can be a pressure, that's, a pressure gradient, really, that's set up with all the water that piles up. And that water's got to go somewhere. So as you can see in the slide, it, it often goes in a parallel direction towards the beach. And, and uh, gathering it up at a point where there's less water and maybe a low point, perhaps a, a, a crevice or a break in the sandbar. And then it rushes out in, in, in a very rapid fashion. Uh, maybe the, the little channel where it goes out can be as, as, like as little as five or 10 yards, uh, something very narrow, but very dangerous because the, 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 the speed of the water can be uh, three, four, five feet per second. That's really hard to swim against. And if you look at the little uh, um, line uh, beneath the slide there, uh, this is from the U.S. Life Saving Association. Uh, in 2011, about 31,000 out of 60,000 uh, total rescues by lifeguards involved rip currents. So lifeguards are, are, to some degree, they're in the rip current business. Um, they are the first responders for rip currents, and for the purposes of, of this project, they're also the, uh, the spotters. Now, um, the weather fatalities, this, this HASTATS um, graph, you know, you look at this graph and right away the, the 553 uh, tornado deaths from last year really grabs you, and uh, you know, that's, it's devastating. Um, but if you look to the right, you see the, the, the rip currents there. Okay, 41 deaths um, last year, 2011, reported to the Weather Service, uh, 46 on average. And so, you know, there might be some underreporting, um, according to the <coughs> USLA uh, president. Um, it may be, uh, by, maybe by a factor of two, we could be losing 80 or 90 people a year to rip currents. Um, and if you look at that, that graph, it's every year. That's the average. And so it's, rip currents are a little bit like flash floods. Uh, they don't get as much attention, perhaps, as they should. It's a very local phenomena. It's sort of drip, drip in the fatalities, one or two people. You know, uh, not uh, dramatic in terms of, of, of you know, mass you know, fatalities or things like that, like tornadoes might be, but it gets a consistent uh, killer along the beaches. Now here, uh, Dr. Wu provided a, a slide of, of, of rip current deaths over a course of 10 years on uh, um, the coastlines of the U.S., including the Great Lakes. And uh, a quick you know, look at it shows that Florida has the worst problem um, in terms of pure number of deaths, uh, California as well. But anywhere can be a, a uh, anywhere there, there's a beach, can you can have a rip current circumstance, uh, even in uh, the Great Lakes. Now, um, <coughs> forecasters uh, can, can issue rip current uh, um, outlooks and forecasts through the surf zone forecast, and, and you can provide you know, rip current statements and things like that. Um, but uh, the question is, you know, how well are you doing? You, know, you need verification to, 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 to uh, check against. And when all the observations of rip currents, you can't really verify. Now, in 2004, the National Weather Service and, Service and Sea Grant Rip Current Technical Workshop uh, uh, had a finding that said, uh, a pilot program should be implemented to monitor rip currents so as to reduce the hazard they pose to the public. And that statement is sort of like the, the main uh, impetus, or is a main impetus for this, this project. And it kind of sums up very nicely. Now, I mentioned collaboration before. It's a very much a team effort. Uh, we have uh, MDL here in OST with the development of, uh, and the, the data transfer and the science. Uh, we have Aquas uh, for policy. Um, we have the WFOs uh, you know, with, with, with their um, in information and their, their relationships with the lifeguards. And the WFO lifeguard uh, relationship is especially important. So without, uh, um, without this collaboration between these different groups, uh, this can't work. So we started off, I think, in 2004, 2005, um, with the San Diego Forecast Office, and uh, several folks went out there and started to coordinate with um, both the WFO and the lifeguards, and, and it was a good place to start. The WFO in San Diego has a great relationship with their lifeguard agencies, and from there we, we, we built a, a, a uh, setup where um, be three different beaches in San Diego give us rip current reports, and from there we've expanded uh, to uh, several more forecast offices, and I think about uh, uh, over uh, 15 or 16 beaches at this point. Uh, those are the, each beach is represented by a little dot there. 
and that the individual beaches are important because this rip currents happen on a beach by beach basis or even internally you know within a beach so here's the whole uh, process here and we'll go through uh, each step one by one okay the first uh, step is the lifeguard observes uh, the rip current state and reports to uh, MDL and the WFOs uh, twice a day now um, what they'll be looking at and looking for are, 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 are things that can cause rip currents and, and you know, where rip currents can set up. And I mentioned before I'm not going to talk too much about uh, rip current structure, but th these type of circumstances and, and uh, issues are, are going to come up later in our web form. Uh, so if you're a lifeguard, you've got to be aware that if you have uh, uh, waves coming at normal or near normal towards your shore, you're more likely to have uh, rip currents uh, in and around where your like, uh, breaches in your sandbar are and things like that. Uh, if you have permanent structures like you see on the right-hand side there, then maybe an oblique wave coming in is going to pile up against that structure and then jet out. So you can have a, a rip current occur uh, on, on the, the, where the side where the wave is hitting. Um, so the angle of the wave coming in matters. Uh, the, the slope of the beach, the bathymetry matters. Uh, if you have a, a, a very uh, gentle slope, uh, you can have the wave will break uh, further out and sort of tumble in uh, a great distance as you have a lot of water mass transport. Again, that water's got to get back out again, and so you can have a rip current provoked. Um, if you have a, a steeper beach, um, it's less likely to, to develop a rip current, but that still can happen. You can still have a rip current on a steeper beach. Water levels matter. Um, we talk about, mentioned here uh, this is tide modulation rip currents again another very good comment slide um, but uh, you know with, with in terms of water level uh, the Great Lakes can can see this with with seasonal variations and satious uh, changes in the water level uh, can change the width of the surf zone and again the amount of water mass transport that has to get out and as the water level gets lower you can get a choke point around your sandbars where, where this, the water has to sort of weave around there and find the lowest spot, and that's where the, the, the rip current can, can set up. Uh, in addition, there's even human factors, which uh, um, uh, we don't always account for, but we should, in terms of the, the people going off further and, and uh, when there's low tide, they maybe get too far from the lifeguards. Okay, so what will happen uh, with our lifeguards uh, is they will report um, twice a day to their their headquarters, um, and the headquarters is, is used uh, because they have basically internet access. And the, the headquarters will have access to MDL's web form. Now this format was developed originally by San Diego, and, and we've appropriated and used it uh, for several different uh, um, forecast offices. Uh, John Chattel, when he's not doing RIT, is, among other things, uh, developing these web forms. And you can see uh, the, the kind of information we're asking for is what uh, we've pretty much just talked about. Um, I'll go from the top left uh, across the rows here. Uh, beach name, in this case, is the Daytona Beach uh, for the Melbourne Forecast Office. Report date and time. Um, surf height, uh, surf zone width. Uh, incoming wave direction, uh, you know, you know, the importance of that in terms of rip current formation. The tide, uh, the tide state. Um, the, the yes or no answer is the rip observed, and then the, the rip current activity, and we'll define that in a, in a couple slides. Um, uh, the number of rip rescues and, and the water temperature. Uh, water temperature, it, it, there's a few reasons uh, we ask for that. Uh, uh, one is that uh, some forecast offices get that anyway, and so we want to incorporate the, the normal uh, reporting back and forth between the beaches and the forecast offices into this form. And second of all, it can sort of give you a reality check. If you expected to see a lot of rip rescues during a high rip current event, and you see the water temperature was really cold, then you think, okay, well, maybe the, 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 the beaches weren't crowded that day. And so you sort of like a, a check against the data you're getting. Uh, comments, um, extra comments uh, for the lifeguards. And uh, at the very bottom, we have a lifeguard name. And this is important for, for MDL because uh, uh, we want to see the, really, that's the data source. And so if there's any uh, uh, unintentional but subjective bias, uh, in terms of rip current reporting, uh, one lifeguard says that the one rip current, uh, the rip currents are always uh, high level, and one rip, one lifeguard doesn't report rip currents at all. 
then we want to sort of know the names uh, just so we have you know that information because that is you know, in the end the data source for the observation. Okay, so um, the the headquarters of the lifeguard office has uh, uh, just submitted the, the the data in the web form, and it, it goes uh, you know through the NWS web form, okay into a database where we store it. Okay, right now it's a, um, a, a, a couple of step process because we're getting emails from these web forms and, and uh, uh, they're, they're then inputted into NIDS um, manually. Uh, eventually we'll get to the point where we can remove that email middleman and have direct uh, inputting of the data into the NIDS database. Now the emails we get though, uh, here's roughly uh, with some variation uh, between uh, WFOs, what they look like. Uh, this is from Jacksonville Beach yesterday. And uh, you can see the, the, the great amount of detail that uh, um, we get from the lifeguards. Uh, one thing that's really great about working with uh, the lifeguards, I think, is, is you know, they're very observant, they know their beaches, and they really want to share the information. They really do. And so this gives them the, the ability to do that and provide situational awareness for, for the WFOs. Yeah, that's referring to the comment, yeah. Now, I mentioned uh, rip current activity level before. That's the, the levels that we're asking uh, the, the, life, the lifeguards to judge. And um, again, subjective assessment of activity of rip currents that can impact swimmers at a particular beach, uh, both strength and, uh, um, and uh, numbers. And so high activity is many strong rip currents uh, down to no activity. Okay, now step four, uh, supplemental data added. We want to be able to use uh, these observations uh, to help uh, uh, create forecasting tools. And so uh, what we're doing uh, is uh, retrieving data from models, uh, the, 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 the grid points associated with the beaches and also the nearest buoys, uh, the measurable uh, um, variables there up in the top right, um, measurable parameters when they're available, and inputting them into the database. Again, uh, uh, John's doing a great deal of work uh, to get these into the database, and we're trying to have a completely automated structure as soon as we can. Um, so the idea is we have, we'll have there the, the building blocks of, of uh, a forecasting tool, and at the same time, you know, sitting right next to them in a the database will be the observations of the lifeguards. So, step five, um, the analyzation of the observations. Okay, so we have both WFO and MDL down there. Uh, the WFOs uh, get the same information that we do uh, right now by email and eventually, you know, through through database access and, and whatever is the most appropriate. Um, and so they've already uh, benefited from uh, the the increased communications with the lifeguards. Uh, it's improved their situational awareness, and we have several. Uh, um, responses uh, from the WFOs we've worked with to that effect. And here's a, a really good example. Um, the, the numbers in the blue boxes are, are rip current rescues at, along a certain beach uh, during a, a two month span in 2008. And if you look at the, the surf uh, height in feet across the, the, the top there, um, you would think that most of the rip current rescues would occur in very high surf as the waves really come crashing in. But what the San Diego Weather Forecast Office found was that the, a lot of rescues occur when the, the, the surf height is, is not that high, two to three feet. It's fairly mild, it's not a strong wave, but it still can produce uh, strong rip currents. And so this is a, a really tangible example of the kind of information that has been provided uh, uh, to the WFOs from the lifeguards through this increased communication. And we have here a San Diego, California WFO rip current hazard map. Um, and on the right is a, a uh, you know, statement from, from Noel Isla of the San Diego Forecast Office. Uh, um, this ongoing project is a good example of how a clear goal and good communications between headquarters, WFO, emergency partners, and the media can work and be a successful for a common cause. Again, it's very much a collaborative effort. Uh, 
we're, we all have to work together. Okay, now we mentioned the analysis of uh, the, the forecast offices. Now here we get to MDL's analysis and the work of Dr. Uh, C.S. Wu. Now uh, CS has uh, several different uh, rip current forecasting tool uh, approaches and depending on uh, what works best for each beach. And again, this is a, a beach by beach problem. Uh, each beach has a different influence depending on the orientation or slope or, or uh, whatever local effect. So you re you've really got to uh, approach it uh, you know, on a very local basis. Um, and so when available, we can incorporate uh, the different measurable parameters, uh, both in terms of models and, and uh, observations, uh, significant wave heights, coastal winds, peak wave periods, total water levels. Uh, in the middle there, you see other factors to take into account. Uh, beach orientation, again, it affects really the, the, the angle of the wave coming in um, and how they, how they interact um, and perhaps form rip currents. Uh, I have hot weather there, but it could be weather in general because, again, if you're looking at past data and you're, you're expecting to see rip current rescues behave in a certain fashion, then uh, you've really got to know what was happening, uh, not just in the water, but on the beach. Um, beach sand characteristics. Uh, bathymetry is very important. Uh, sometimes it's a little difficult to get up-to-date bathymetry measurements, uh, so you can use the, the size of the sand granules as a proxy to estimate beach slope. Now, CS has used several different uh, types of uh, models, uh, different approaches, and whatever works best uh, is, is the approach to take. Now, here's a case study of uh, uh, rip current activity in Daytona Beach. Uh, the forecast office at, um, is Melbourne, Florida, uh, one of our partners. And so you can see the tracks and histories of three hurricanes here, Irene, Katya, and Maria. And this is a busy graph, but really it's, it's the, we're, we're just going to focus on, on the, the, the core issue here, which is um, how the, the, the rip current uh, algorithm that CS developed was, could compare to the rip current uh, observations of lifeguards. And if you see those uh, uh, blue, uh, vertical blue uh, lines there, uh, those are uh, what we call rip current episodes. Um, uh, right at the very top there, extended period of medium to high rip current activity. Uh, the rip current activity, again, is how we defined it before, uh, you know, from none to high. And so um, where we have arrows pointing uh, there, rip episode Irene, rip episode, rip episode Katya, and Maria, those blue lines are where the lifeguards are, pointing, or are reporting strong rip currents. And the, the black line there is CS's algorithm. And so there's, there's a, a definite uh, uptick uh, in, in CS's algorithms as the, the the rip current activity is increasing along uh, uh, Daytona Beach, as, as evidenced by the lifeguard uh, observations. And so this is a, a model and uh, a model compared to its verification. So we, we think we do have some skill added there. Uh, here's some uh, guidance skill scores uh, from uh, two of the hurricanes, Irene and Katya, and summer 2011 in general for Daytona Beach, Florida. Now, um, exter experimental, excuse me, MDL rip current activity level page. Uh, this is something else that, that John Chattel has been working on. Um, as we get the rip current activity levels from uh, the lifeguards, you know, low, moderate, high, none, um, those can be uh, uh, mapped into uh, Google Maps and displayed in this fashion. Uh, right now there's a manual process going on, but again, we're gonna, we're gonna get to a point where as soon as the lifeguard issues a report, uh, it's gonna show up on the, on the Google map here. So uh, in this case, on the left, you see a report from Mission Beach with medium rip current activity. Okay, um, our, short term, our short term goals uh, as we continue with this project uh, is, uh, is to uh, provide, number one, provide uh, forecast offices and our partners, including the, the lifeguard agencies, with instant, instant access to past lifeguard reports, supplemental data, and automated local rip current guidance. So as we move forward uh, uh, developing our, our uh, um, software for NIDS, uh, we'll be able to automatically update uh, uh, both uh, 
the, the rip current data, and that we get from the lifeguards, and uh, couple that with the, the observations from the buoys and the model data, uh, and our own rip current algorithms. And we'll have that in a, store, in a database that will uh, be accessible instantaneously uh, um, to the uh, forecast offices and others. Uh, the second goal here, um, assist forecast offices with setting up rip current collaboration with local lifeguard agencies. Uh, we're always looking for new partners uh, um, with other, for other new forecast offices. And so if uh, there are any folks on the line who are not uh, collaborating with yet that would love to work with you uh, and will help you, uh, uh, you know, get set up with uh, you know, this project. And the third uh, uh, short-term goal there is uh, um, send RIP current reports and alerts to WFOs uh, via AWIPS. Now, uh, the San Diego Weather Forecast Office has a really nice feature. They're actually sending their RIP current reports uh, through uh, Skywarn in a, a web form that looks a lot like uh, what we use and what they've used in the past. And that uh, report goes right to AWIPS, uh, thanks to its, its Skywarn uh, um, you know, origin. And so you have, you, you have sort of the, you know, the idea, again, of, of lifeguards as spotters. Uh, and we think that's a really nice feature to be able to see it within AWIPS, and we want to go there ourselves with our own web form. Now, our longer-term goals, uh, again, we sort of mentioned before where we want to go uh, is to develop a beach-specific rip current forecast and, and diagnostic uh, set. Uh, again, it's, it's a beach-by-beach -beach process. Uh, every beach is a little bit different, and, but we do want to you know, add value to the forecast tools that, that either don't, you know, that are out there already or create forecast tools at places where they don't exist for individual beaches. Um, now, since, you know, every beach is, is unique and, and uh, uh, it's a beach-by-beach -beach basis. Uh, you know, CS can't uh, do all the thousands of beaches himself and that sort of thing. So uh, we want to create a, 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 a consistent methodology, you know, uh, how we're looking at things, uh, and, and share that with the forecast offices. And so the, the WFOs, you know, through uh, the, the knowledge that MDL has and, and also through the database that we're building, uh, can go back and develop rip current uh, algorithms of their own. And... Um, Finally, as uh, an example of uh, you know, the, I, I guess one good example of number three, share lifeguard reports and rip current diagnostics and forecasts with the public. Uh, a good example would be the web form that we just showed you, you know, where you're seeing the rip current activity level. Uh, you know, and that's really that's the, the, the end goal too. Uh, we want to you know, share, share the information we have and, and hopefully you know, value added uh, forecasts uh, with, uh, with the public, both us and the WFOs. And so, you know, with, with this shared um, collaborative project, us working together with the emergency managers who really are the lifeguards and, the, and our spotters and with the WFOs, we, we hope to, uh, you know, work towards, uh, you know, the IDSS uh, model, the impact of based decision support services approach for rip current hazards. It's uh, a very important uh, and maybe underappreciated hazard that we have, and it deserves a lot of attention. And I guess I'll end here with uh, a, a photograph from uh, uh, Encinitas. Uh, uh, this is uh, the uh, officials from the city of Encinitas, including the mayor, uh, along with uh, personnel from uh, uh, MDL and uh, their lifeguard agencies and the forecast office, the San Diego forecast office. Uh, again, it's, it's all of us working together collaboratively, uh, and, and uh, uh, it's the only way it can work. And right now we've, 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 you know, we're very hopeful that they, well, this project will bear fruit. Okay, thank you, Mike. Uh, very good. Uh, as per usual, our custom here, I'd like to first, uh, for the Q&A section, to uh, offer folks who are on the line if they have any questions or comments uh, to go ahead, and then we'll go in, here in Silver Spring. So any, co any questions for uh, Mike or the team? Yeah, this is Rick Watling at Eastern Region Headquarters. Um, with regard to data acquisition, I, you know, I didn't get a good look at that form for reporting, but I saw, I thought I saw it said report time, and I'm wondering, does everybody know that report time should be the same as the rip current time, or, because we've had instances in the past with our local storm reports where people put in the time that they received the report rather than the time that the event happened, and it it seems to me that from a quality control standpoint on your data, you would need to be a little more specific and make sure that people fill in the time of the rip current. 
Uh, okay. Want me to address that? Is or? that in there any part? Or is that a report of an, a rip current? If it's a report of the conditions for the morning, then that's a little different than saying, hey, I have a rip current right here. It says report time. Is there any place on that form that says rip current time? Uh, no, there's there's no place that says rip current time. I think we, we tend to get reports, um, again, twi twice a day. And you're going to get them after after the lifeguard has left the beach, and so hopefully the, the lifeguard isn't putting in at 5 p.m. when he gets off shift, you know. If it's a report, you can do that. If it's saying, I have a rip current right here right now, that's a little different. Right, but what if it happened at 2 in the afternoon and he doesn't get off shift till 5? Is he going to accidentally put in the wrong time? I'm just saying you, you might want to make the individual rip current the language a little more... Um, let, let, I'll, I'll jump in here because um, I've sort of look at, have watched this project evolve, and I'll put some comments. So uh, the team, uh, Mike, John, and CS, have, uh, generally work with each WFO to on these very issues you're talking about, and it's an iterative process, uh, and it's not perfect. Um, and, and so, you know, when when it's oftentimes when they go to visit and talk with the lifeguards and et cetera. So, so it's an issue, but I think we've effectively handled this. And, and, and um, the other aspect I'll mention is that through um, uh, Nicole Kurkowski, we we've learned um, become aware of some mobile apps that are that are uh, allow like the exact time of observations to be entered in things. So this is an evolving. I, I believe this will evolve. Uh, as we go along, but I think we're reasonably comfortable that that with uh, the uh, collective looking at the observations that we get from both the WFOs and and, and MDL that they're they're useful to us. And um, you know, if they're if they're way out of base, then we can with the, you know working with the lifeguards, we can try to uh, improve that. Yeah, that's um, and you know one thing you know, so far, you know, we mentioned the the, you know, the smart you know, potential smart tools or you know, smartphones to use. This hasn't always been a uh, an instantaneous process. You know, they they don't always call in. You know, at the moment of the rip current, you know, they call in when they can. Uh, but it, but we do have the mass of data that uh, um, you know we have access to. So, CS, you want to say something? Or? Yeah. Uh, right now, as you can see, the web phone. Uh, this one is I designed uh, and work with uh, San Diego uh, Focus Office, and uh, we don't limit uh, the time. You can enter the time on the top right at any time, but uh, in order to be operation, uh, operational purposes, so we just follow the uh, weather forecast uh, uh, routine. Say we uh, do it on the morning, in the morning, 10 o'clock, and in the afternoon, 4 o'clock. But uh, as I uh, point, point out in the comment, if he finds any severe condition, he can enter any time. So uh, the uh, forecast uh, can update. Right. And the other aspect too is, which Mike described, is the the use of the buoy data and the model data. It also helps in the quality control. So because they're they're asked to, to report not just the rip currents but the the uh, the ancillary conditions uh, in the surf zone. So we can kind of cross check um, as well. Uh, other other. Did we answer that question? Well, oh, I just I just hope that. There, you guys understand there's a distinction between the time a report is made and the time an event occurs. That's all. Okay. Uh, I did have one other point. Sure. If you're using rescues for verification, that's not a good thing to do because if you put out a warning of a high risk and uh, people don't go in the water, your number of rescues is going to drop. So the meteorological or oceanographic conditions could still be a high risk, but uh, because of the feedback, you know, you you alter the outcome of the number of people rescued by virtue of the fact that you issue a warning. Right. For it. And um, that might explain why you get a lot more rescues with uh, a medium risk rather than a high risk. People just don't go in the water when there's a high risk. Or, or there could be a red flag and things like that. That's absolutely true. Correct. I mean, that's uh, you know, one reason to look at the at the additional data is to try to, to quality control the, the you know the number of rescues. You know, it, it's it's a good uh, you know information. I think it's a good information to have just to look at in the context of everything else that's going oh, on. Oh, absolutely, it's good to have. It's just uh, you wouldn't necessarily want to use the number of rescues as a as a uh, basis for saying you had uh, you know 
a high high rip current day or something. That's all I have. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Uh, other other questions? Yeah, this is Tampa Weather. We've been uh, working with uh, Moat Marine, and it's mostly Moat Marine's work uh, to provide uh, to get lifeguards to provide uh, uh, rip current observations, and they're also uh, observing other things. They they've been equipped with phones with cameras and a web form to enter the information on. And um, I'm wondering if there's a way to combine what they've done with what you're doing. What's the source that, what did you say? Web can. No, no, but Moat the mer marine, what did you say? Merchant marine? Oh, it's, it's Moat Marine Laboratory. Oh. And they've worked with lifeguard agencies. Are you in the uh, Gulf of Mexico, oh, is that right? Yeah. Yes, in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, along the uh, peninsula west coast and also the panhandle coast uh, where there are barrier islands and, and some wave action. Okay, um, yeah, uh, okay, thank you for that. Uh, other other uh, questions, comments? I didn't really get an answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> well, th th that, uh, we'll, we will check uh, on using that source to um, you know, incorporate within. Now, I, I mean that that particular. Um, um, you know, I, I don't know if we have any issues with. Uh, is this Charlie? Yeah, this is Charlie. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah uh, I see us. Yeah, hi. Uh, I uh, told you that uh, this is definitely possible. And right now, as you see the uh, fertility, reef fertility, the highest. Uh, States are California and Florida, so that's our first priority. And later, I will go to Gulf of Mexico to uh, cover your uh, area. Then we will incorporate uh, with the local data source. Okay, sounds good. Thanks. Uh, we have a question in the room here. Go ahead. I'd just like to get the contact information from that uh, gentleman because next Thursday we're actually getting together for MDL to meet with the Stevens. Okay, I'll, uh, CS can provide you the contact. Okay. A couple, a couple of dumb questions, if I may. Um, are, are rip currents always visible? Is it always detected visually? Are they always what? Visible? Yeah. Detected visually. So, so no, no. No. Very good question. Yeah, it's not always uh, easy uh, to identify. That's why uh, uh, we can talk about that uh, on the smartphone uh, meeting. You, know, you must uh, be uh, reported by a lifeguard, and uh, even say professional lifeguard. Yeah. The, the other question is: there's a slide there that, that shows the, uh, <coughs> it was uh, like the number of events or number of rescues. That's what it was. Uh, uh, but is that normalized for attendance? Because I think you collect that, right? Uh, well, this was from the, the report from the lifeguard. Uh, right. Yeah. So you have the number of rescues, but is it segregated? Uh, by category, right? Right. So is it segregated by the attendance at the beach? No. No, by the no. people who yeah. rescue. Because that, that may bias yeah, the... Exactly, yeah. yeah. And, and so recently the, the, the group, the team's been working with the Long, uh, the Long Island office. Uh, Jones Beach is, you know, in this time of year, it's very, very large population on the weekends and things. So, so yeah, that, that, that would be the proper way to look at the actual risk, I guess, you know, in factoring that in. I, I would I'll point out to acknowledge that uh, Mike showed these uh, comet uh, figures, and, and Dr. Wu was the principal subject matter expert in working with Comet to develop this module. So, so CS is a source of a lot of this material. He didn't he didn't make the drawings, but <laughs> uh, other questions or comments, Dennis. Uh, the map you showed earlier about where you have the cooperation. They still look rather sparse. What is your overall ambition? Yeah. yeah, well, uh, this is a good question. Um, I'll, I'll take a crack at it. Uh, I, uh, we were involved, 
uh, MDL has been involved with the um, flash flood uh, monitoring prediction, the FFMP tool, and to me there's a, there, are, there are similarities towards that effort for flash floods and the, and the rip current. And, and as those of you may know with the FFMP, basically uh, the entire U.S. Is, is, is digitized in terms of its stream basins because flash floods occur at a local and local streams, right? So the problem of flash flooding demands that it, it's, it requires local information in case of basin uh, elevation, et cetera. And the rip currents are very similar. So every beach is unique and every beach has its own bathymetry, et cetera. So, so we're, we're, I think it's safe to say we're trying to look for a methodology to be able to uh, provide relevant tools and guidance uh, that, that WFOs and, and lifeguards c could use for local beaches around the country, um, keeping in mind there are many beaches which have no lifeguards, uh, et cetera, that's an, another issue. But uh, it certainly is for the major population centers and where there are lots of uh, occupied beaches, we're, 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 we would like to eventually cover all of those. Uh, the, the, um, the, uh, area around the, the Great Lakes was driven by the fact that although the Great Lakes doesn't get that many, uh, because it was three years ago, there was an uh, anomalous number of, of uh, fatalities in the Great Lakes, and, and that spurred a lot of interest. So uh, we worked with the two, uh, two to three offices up there to, to begin the, the program of getting the lifeguards, again, who are only there seasonally, to participate. Um, so, I mean, there's uh, I think that would be what we're looking to, you know, achieve. Brad? Is this something where a local lifeguard gets very, they sort of get a sense of the bad days, I would assume, for their beaches, they probably know a certain direction. And if you become a local expert if you're a lifeguard at a beach for a number of years? That's sort of one question. The other is, what do beaches do that don't have help? And what, what is sort of the local solution to communicating with current hazards? What's, what's being done locally? Well, I, let me answer sure. uh, one. Um, the, the, if you're a, a lifeguard at a beach for a certain uh, you know, number of years, yeah, you really know the beach. And you, you know, some, like we were up in Jones Beach uh, just recently uh, in Robert Moses Beach on Long Island, uh, individual lifeguards were, 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 according, were sectioned at different parts of the beach. And, and even those parts of the beach, and these are fairly long beaches, had their own uh, characteristics. Um, there was the, this. This original picture here, um, you know, this is uh, uh, Nelson Vaz and Tim Morin from, from uh, uh, Upton, OKX, WFO, and uh, CS, and one of the lifeguards. And as we, we, um, a as we, we were talking uh, we, on that mound, the lifeguard was sort of slumped in his, his uh, seat back there. He found out we were from the National Weather Service, and he jumped right up. And, and was, it started talking about if the wind waves come from the you know, left to right and the swells come from, from east to west. So, so they're, very, they're, you know, they're very attentive and they're very, uh, you know, again, eager to, to, to uh, you know, really share the information they have with, with the Weather Service. Yeah, I, I second that. I mean, when I was uh, uh, with Noel in uh, San Diego, I visited uh, Moonlight Beach, and, and the lifeguards are incredibly knowledgeable about, and they, and they have eagle eyes. Um, the, the career ones, anyway. Uh, it, it depends. Like LA County, they have a lot of volunteers. Uh, where th different beaches operate differently, so the experience level could can <coughs> vary quite a bit. Uh, but the other aspect I, I w that, that your second question I think l uh, alludes to is uh, in future what what what. So, so we, we can see, you know, we have a general idea that when there are, um, you know, tropical storms passing along the East Coast that rip currents are attendant to those either prior and after, et cetera. But, but we're beginning to see that there are these spikes, periods where they sort of, the onset of a lot of activity is very distinct and, and then it, it rises and then it stops. And so these, these periods are, are times when the lifeguards are intensely involved with either closing the beaches or, or monitoring for, uh, you know, preventative rescues, as they call them, like flagging people out of the water when they might be in trouble. So um, the linkage to forecast models, because the signals are coming from parameters that are, that are, that are what ocean models predict. So it's possible that we, be, we may be able to, using those ocean forecast models, be able to predict the uh, onset of these episodes at specific beaches, in which case, 
you know, we, it's conceivable that we could give a, a day, uh, you know, heads up for they could maybe improve their staffing and their awareness, uh, you know, to, to reduce the activity. But, you know, we're not there yet. Um, other, other questions? On the line. Bob. The, the graph you showed with the blue spike, can you bring that up? Yeah, I'm just scroll through it here. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so I don't have the escape button on the uh, thing here. Almost there. Yeah. I think you talked about the ones above the line. What What is the horizontal stratification there? You've got two little and then you got one down there. So what there, there, there are four uh, categories of, um, uh, there is a uh, none or very low, which is at the bottom half of this, uh, what, the four what the lifeguards observe and what CS index produces. Then there's the medium. The, the medium and the low, excuse me, the low and the medium are the very skinny categories or uh, appear on the diagram. And the top is all the high. So you can see that uh, in the the uh, spikes in in CS's index uh, are are in that top category, right. and there are lifeguard observations are those blue bars that you know sort of correlate well. And then on the bottom, and when the lifeguards were reporting none or very low, their observations you know re agree reasonably well at the low periods as well. So they weren't seeing anything either. Um, there's a lot of uh, and you can see the rescues. And the point earlier, I think, about the, the rescues is, is very important. The, the human factors uh, is, is, the, is really a key uh, in, in, under, in reducing the number of fatalities. So in particular, the question when you have a, a, a coastal approaching a tropical storm is, is when, you know, the, so obviously surfers like to go out and swimmers like the waves. That's part of it. So, so but the, the, the storm may be quite far away. And so knowing when the rip current activity begins uh, prior to the arrival of a tropical storm and when, when the rip current activity dies down after the storm has passed away is, is important for uh, the WFOs and the lifeguards to know in terms of you know, giving guidance uh, to beachgoers and, and the WFOs. One, one more comment uh, from Eastern Region. Uh, I'm hearing a lot about this algorithm that's being developed. I don't see anything in this presentation about uh, strong rip currents versus many rip currents. And what I mean by that is, okay, depending on the direction of the wave, the orientation, the bathymetry, okay, you may have a lot of rip currents, but if the flow is very weak that day, you might not have a strong rip current um, in any of those many locations where rip currents develop. I'm just wondering, how, how you uh, differentiate between a strong rip current and many rip currents? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll say, and then CS can. Yeah, we. This slide here is what we uh, we we worked with the lifeguards and CS and etc. So so it's it's difficult in any individual rip current. We we don't have any hope at this point of of determining the strength. So what working with the lifeguards, what the best we have been able to settle on so far. Is, is their ob subjective assessment of the level of threat when when they have when their jobs become the sort of the the worst or in terms of rescues so that it, it subjectively is many and what they would determine strong rip currents so it, it's, it's inherently subjective because of the the nature but we're the definitions that we we have so far are designed to um, Focus on the the lifeguards' activity in, with regard to the to the rip currents. So you can have a very strong rip current right. and only one of them, and that would not result necessarily in high, uh, high activity um, at a particular beach. But but generally that situation, I believe the lifeguards can they can rope off the. the the beach, part of the beach where that very strong rip current is and try to keep people out of it. Uh, it's less of an issue for them as opposed to a day where there are many, many strong rip currents or the, some, sometimes the, the, the mega rip currents that San Diego saw like two years ago 
uh, I believe it was on a very busy weekend. It is, Roger's on the line. There was one weekend where there was like a, a surfing contest and there was these uh, so-called mega rip currents that appeared in San Diego beaches. That was quite extraordinary. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there such a thing as a uh, few strong rip currents? <laughs> Richard, as you see uh, the category here, actually, uh, when I desire this uh, uh, criteria, when we try to access the, assess the uh, rip current activity, I try to be in line with the OQUAS uh, uh, policy. That's the rip current outlook, right? Yeah. But actually, uh, I, I interact with the lifeguard to see can they identify in this way, yeah, and how do they identify usually. So it, finally, we uh, comes out these uh, uh, four category. Yeah, uh, the, the most serious one is the high, and uh, the uh, uh, few re, uh, weak rip current, just a generally uh, case, then it's low, and the between is a medium. So that's all. And, and right now, uh, this is not uh, uh, finalize the, in, in the future, uh, OQAS is going to uh, uh, raise this issue, uh, see uh, how many category are we going to uh, identify uh, the uh, uh, risk of uh, rip hazard. Other questions or comments? Yeah, this is uh, Jeff Medlin in Mobile. <clears throat> the uh, rip current. Uh, this is just something I wanted to bring up uh, as a suggestion based on the parameters that I saw on the on your uh, GUI where you enter the report. Rip currents occur uh, all the time, whether weather is enhancing them or not. Um, I think one of the things we do in in the field uh, that that is the best is we are we're getting pretty good at identifying uh, when weather enhances the potential of a rip current within the breaker zone. And uh, just looking at the checklist uh, that you have there for the report and uh, what you're considering with regard to the predictors, are you, it doesn't look like you've considered, uh, like for example, when the wind direction uh, uh, opposes the incoming uh, swell energy. Uh, that's sometime, uh, would be a good example of sometimes when we get many reports uh, when we have an opposing wind uh, uh, against the incoming uh, wave energy. Uh, so I, I was just bringing that up as a consideration. Uh, are you, is it your goal necessarily to tackle the uh, oceanographic ac aspects of this first and, and then move into the weather uh, potential uh, or not? I, I, I can respond first, and MCS can respond if he wants to. Um, uh, you know, this is just you know, really limited to, to the, the things that we need to ask of the, the lifeguards that we really can't get anywhere else. Um, and so if, if, you know, if, there, if there's a nearby observation, uh, we can get the, the wind observation data and we can, you know, for forecasting, we get the you know, wind direction you know, from, from there or from model data. Um, so we do want to account for those you know, types of things, but uh, you know, you know, this is something, not, not, we're not ignoring them, we're just sort of uh, focusing in on exactly what's going going on uh, only at the beach uh, with this report. Uh, can you go to uh, slide 24? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Keep going. Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, if you look at under the uh, rip current forecasting tool, what are the physical important parameters? You can see that uh, wind is listed as a second uh, uh, the parameter. Yeah. So we do consider wind speed and wind direction. For example, like a 15 knots is like a criteria. And if it's onshore wind, then uh, the wave tend to, tend to be uh, more breaking. And if it's opposing the wind, then the wave break later. Yeah, so I do consider that one in order to calculate the age. Okay, thank you. I didn't see that the first time around, and I didn't see it on the primary GUI for the report. I just thought I would bring that up. Very good. No problem. Other other questions, comments? Yeah, one one more uh, field that might be uh, useful would be uh, for lifeguards to input when a rescue is made, where the rescue 
uh, took place where the people within the surf zone near shore uh, between the sandbars or well out past the, uh, the breakers. I um, uh, asked, uh, do, how um, often do are the are the lifeguards? Do they do um, they, they they provide the rescue information pretty consistently? Um, not well, not that particular rescue information. You know, they'll get a number of rescues and no, things like that, and we'll get, get the rip current state and the, really the, the surf state. We but we don't have that detailed information of, of the rescues. Um, you know, so far. Right, and it, it's safe to say that, of course, just you know when when. When the lifeguard, the primary business is to save lives and so forth. So we we, we recognize that that uh, that in a very busy periods that they they're going to do that and not necessarily uh, provide you know everything that we would like. That's just understood. Um, but yeah, I th I think that uh, Mike characterized it very well. I thought that we've been so pleased with um, working with. The lifeguard agencies—they are just really super, and their 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 primary interest is 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 saving lives, and they're more than happy to help out in this area. So it's it's really been rewarding, I think, for all of us to to work with the WFOs and the, the lifeguards to to move this forward. Okay, any any last questions? Very well, very good, uh, and thanks uh, to. Uh, Mike Cherma and C.S. Wu and John Chattel. Uh, the next uh, RIT forum it will be on uh, Wednesday, August 15th, and we're going to have Steve Pritchett provide us an update on the uh, MATIS and the uh, move to uh, transfer that into our operations in the National Weather Service. So I know MATIS is a, is a system that is uh, it's already being used for in weather service, but uh, Steve's going to give us an update on, on where that uh, where that stands. So I uh, hope to see you in uh, in August. Thanks. Thank you.